This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. My guest today, the multi-talented Kelly Ward, is a longtime entertainment industry veteran with a remarkable career that includes extensive experience as an actor, writer, director, producer, and studio executive. Kelly is best known for his co-starring role as T-Bird Putsy in the musical feature film Grease. Additional film credits include co-starring roles in Samuel Fuller's acclaimed The Big Red One and Luis Valdez's Zoot Suit. As a writer and dialogue director, Kelly's credits include over 40 animated series, among them Star vs. the Forces of Evil, The Lion Guard, Jake and the Neverland Pirates, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, Shaggy and Scooby-Doo Get a Clue, and Jakers, The Adventures of Pigglywinks, the latter of which garnered Kelly a Humanitas Prize for writing children's animation and an Emmy Award for Outstanding Directing. Kelly began his writing career as a story editor for Hanna-Barbera Productions, ultimately co-writing the animated feature Once Upon a Forest. He later served as vice president of creative affairs for MCA Universal, where he supervised production on animated television series such as Back to the Future, Fievel's American Tales, and Shelley Duvall's Bedtime Stories. Kelly went on to a four-year term as Vice President of Animation for MGM, co-producing the feature sequel All Dogs Go to Heaven 2, which he co-wrote, and also he produced The New Pink Panther Show, for which I happen to have written one episode. As a director-choreographer of live theater, Kelly has staged dozens of productions ranging from Shakespeare to Sondheim. He has a long affiliation with the University of Southern California School of Dramatic Arts as both a director and adjunct assistant professor. Kelly and I first met more years ago than either of us will admit while we were both students at the USC School of Drama. In addition to his work in animation, Kelly is currently collaborating with artist Phil Mendez and co-writer Cliff McGillivray on a children's book series called The Note Hunter, The First Adventure, The Case of the Haunted Swamp, is available at Amazon.com. So for all of those reasons and many more, it's a truly wonderful joy for me to have my longtime friend Kelly Ward on StoryBeat today. Kelly, thanks so much for joining me. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here with you. Well, the pleasure is mine, believe me. So tell me a little bit about your history. You've been in the business of entertainment for, you know, most of your life. And I know that your parents, Don and Bonnie, were theater mavens in Southern California. How old were you when the show Biz Bug first bit you? Um, <clears throat> the show, it didn't really, well, I guess it did bite me. <laughs> I was pressed into service uh, when my uncle, who was uh, an undergrad at San Diego State University, mm-hmm. was doing a production of Gilbert and Sullivan's Iolanthe, <laughs> and uh, the director needed uh, a Moppet to be the, I guess uh, he's the, 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 the high judge, to, to be the train bearer for the judge in, uh, I think it's Act Two, where they do all the jurisprudence uh, uh, comedy right and uh i got kind of dragged into it kicking and screaming because the little lord fauntleroy costume that they made me wear was <laughs> abhorrent to me at the time um and uh, how old were you i think i was four and a half years oh. old <laughs> and i stole a show uh when i did a little dance with uh with this gentleman whose train i was carrying and at one point, uh, getting bored with the proceedings, I felt I, I needed to clean my nose, and I wiped my nose on his long train. And, <laughs> and uh, I think that's when—that's probably when the bug bit. 
getting a big laugh like that. I was completely unaware of why, of course, but uh, it was pretty delightful. And even my uncle cracked up in the ensemble. So it was pretty good. And you had, and you ha- were in a family where this was not um, not frowned upon to be in the theater, obviously. Um, no, that's the unusual thing. Uh, so many uh, colleagues and friends with whom I've worked over the years have been kind of the black sheep of their family, um, and uh, <laughs> when they wander into the arts, uh, because parents want them to have stable, solid jobs, mm-hmm. and they look upon the entertainment business as being very unstable and unreliable uh but in my case my grandparents were in the entertainment business uh to one degree or another and of course my parents as you said carved out their living as uh, as theater directors choreographers producers here in southern california so so in other words uh it started fairly early in your life not everybody gets into it at the age of four and a half or five um at, at at, at what point did you do some training? Or did you start right away as a little kid, or did it take a while before you started to train? Well, a- as a means of recreation, my parents steered me and my brother and sister, who are also performers. Yes, indeed. Uh, my brother has a very impressive resume. A great career. Especially in live theater. That's, that's Kirby, who's also a friend of mine as well. Absolutely. Uh, he's, he and you have worked on... Broadway shows that have become legendary. Jekyll and Hyde, yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah, that stands out chief among them. Um, uh, instead of instead of being steered towards the usual juvenile activities of uh, Little League or, or uh, softball or bobby socks, mm-hmm. uh, my, uh, my brother and sister and I were sent to tap dance classes mm-hmm. and ballet classes. Um, and so that was our recreation at first, and uh, and those skills eventually came in handy. Although in my case, I I have to confess, I I did miss getting uh, more exposure to sports when I was a kid. Do you, Do you feel like that's uh, impacted you in some odd way? Not in an odd way, but I compensated when I had kids of my own because uh, I I steered them away from the arts <laughs> <laughs> and towards sports. Wow. Uh, so, so none of your kids are, are in the arts at all, then? No, it, it's, that's, that's, not, that's not true. Um, my, my youngest son is, uh, is uh, a fledgling television director. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's uh, been a stage director and actor. He got his BFA in theater at uh, UCSB. Um, he's probably the purest pursuer of the arts, but my oldest son is... Uh, as an executive with Fox. Well, and, uh, it's all in the family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my middle son, I have to say, is a composer and singer on his own time in, in his day-to-day life. He's the, he's the principal planner for Jersey City, New Jersey. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's very much not in the arts, but must be creative, I assume. It, it is, because he does get to, uh, he does get to approve buildings that in some cases are required to have black box theaters in them and uh having been exposed to the arts he can't be buffaloed when people say well yeah we know what we're doing with this theater space he can read the plans and go yeah you know you don't have adequate bathroom space Mm -hmm. you have too big a a refreshment stand and how are you going to get the sets into this theater when it's on the second floor and you've got no elevator big enough to do that but this show is going to broadway (laughs) <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, so when you were a, a kid, you, were you being trained by others than your parents, or was it principally your folks? It was principally by others. Principally by yeah, others. Uh, it, wasn't until, it wasn't until we were in our teens, and I, re- I resisted going into the arts pretty heavily when I got to be about 11, 12, 13 years old. I didn't, I didn't want to... I didn't want to participate that much. What I really wanted to do was stay home and watch Saturday morning cartoons. Of course. And be a ne'er-do-well, uh, or so I thought. But it was good preparation for what came later. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to know that you have failed miserably at being a ne'er-do-well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess so. Yes, yeah. you, yes you have. Um, so what, all that early theater training, um, 
how would you say that that has influenced and informed your work today as both a or as a writer, director and producer? How has that early work informed you, informed what you do today? That's a great question. Um, I grew up in San Diego, of course, mm-hmm. which had a thriving local theater community uh, that uh, was anchored by the Old Globe, mm-hmm. but they had a, a very vibrant musical theater world that centered around the San Diego Civic Light Opera, and they had a wonderful opera company, uh, three or four ballet companies. Um, at the time, the La Jolla Playhouse had come in the 40s, I believe, and gone. It was no longer operational. Mm-hmm. Uh, it got started after I came to L.A. and started my career, but the the city and the culture nurtured local talent, both on the on the acting side of things and on the production side. And there were there were some amazing impresarios down there keeping and driving the theater uh, the theater scene. And because of my family's involvement and their knowledge of all these different people, we we got. The opportunity to work with some of the world's best scenic designers, mm-hmm. watch them work because they were working for the opera and, and the globe, uh, and, and musical theater directors, um, and ballet choreographers, um, and so it was early exposure to a lot of world-class talents who treated the young charges in their care as professional performers. They didn't treat a children's ensemble as children, the same professional standards that you would apply to anybody were applied to the kids. That's interesting. You so you, you were pushed just like the adults were pushed. Absolutely. We were dressed like the adults were dressed. Nobody condescended. Uh, you know, we had to sign in backstage when, when we reported to the theater just like anybody else. Mm-hmm. We had to be responsible for taking and implementing the notes that were given. Uh, by going up to the call board, reading the notes, and checking off the boxes for things that we needed to improve in performance. It was, uh, it was pretty remarkable. So, so Everybody you... was both a, a, a creative artist in their own right and a teacher uh, in the community. So you got a great discipline early on and learned, yes. how, to, and learned oh, how that worked. Absolutely. So what do you do? I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going off of where I was heading, but this is interesting to me. What do you do uh, when you... I assume occasionally bump into an artist who's not so disciplined. Do you do you deal with it in some way? There's, you, you know, no, not really, because They're if all it's pros. somebody who's well into their uh, adulthood, mm-hmm. uh, they are, you know, that cake is baked, right? And everybody has their process, um, uh, and what happens is you tend to cast away from people who are uh, egregious offenders, I guess, of, of protocol. Mm-hmm. They get a reputation. Uh, yeah. It, it's just you want to work with people who are friendly and affable, creative. Uh, uh, my experience has been usually if people are difficult, it's because of some insecurity or some uncertainty about the process. Mm-hmm. And if you can work through those issues whatever problems may have existed tend to evaporate. But there are the occasional just plain difficult personalities. And, you know, you take them as you get them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you, you got both singing and dancing training as a kid, correct? I got more dance training than singing, but I did take, I did take singing lessons. And um, I sang in a lot of choral ensembles. Uh, I sang in church mm-hmm. for a couple years. Uh, so that that gave me uh, a good background in singing, you know, the soprano, alto, tenor, bass parts. And my parents had a, a, a youth performing group called The Bright Side, which spawned a lot of talented young performers uh, who've gone on to great careers. Uh, and we did a lot, of, uh, a lot of choral singing in that group as well. I'm, I'm curious, obviously you are... And, and had from early on um, sort of tr- drilled into you a degree of rhythm and timing and that kind of thing. How has that helped you as a director 
to understand rhythm and timing. Well, it's it's everything, isn't it? I mean, yeah. uh, you're an actor, yeah. and uh, you've done Noel Coward uh, plays. You, that you remember that. Along at pace. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> you, I, I'll never forget, uh, I think uh, you played Simon Bliss in wow. Hay Fever. It was what a, memory a dazzling you have. production, what a sparkling a, production. What a memory you have. A, a tremendous uh, cast, too, that, and, and I think all of those people went on to do wonderful things. Yeah, Martina Fink, uh, who I think became Martina Finch, and then uh, Javier Grajeda, and yes. uh, uh, Luann Bidelic, and yeah. and myself. We all went on to th- other things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, and I remember it uh, as well because it was not done in a theater space. It was done in a... I think in the, uh, town and the gown. lobby of the Town and Gown yep. Ballroom. That's right. That's exactly Beautiful. right. Beautiful. Wow, you have an outstanding memory. I wouldn't expect you to remember that, but that's great. Um, so, all right, so back to the question, which is how has your – I know that you're, you're filled with rhythm in what you do. You're filled with rhythm when you write lines of dialogue. You're filled with rhythm on how a show functions. You're filled with rhythm as the actors are working off of each other. Would you say that your training has been – uh, um, helpful to that, or is it just innate to you? That's a that's interesting. Um, I think the training is probably, if, if there's anything innate about it, the training probably enhances mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sense of pace and tempo and, and rhythm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it is something that uh, that you do develop a feel for. There's a knack for it in some people that. Uh, that informs their work, and I don't know that I consciously rely on it. But every now and then, it'll you know you'll get a a little jolt that that tells you, gee, this 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 scene is not playing quickly enough, or or we're blasting through it too fast, and we're not honoring we're not honoring some of the some of the changes and shifts in the in the in the transactions. Right. I I, w- I would not expect uh, you to be consciously thinking about it very much. I would expect that it's pretty innate at this point, but I also would think that that early training comes through in ways you probably don't even think about. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's like, uh, it's like anything having to do with, with our world. There's, uh, there, when you're learning a skill, whether it's piano or, or, or tap dancing or writing, um, it's kind of like learning to drive a, a, a manual transmission. Uh, it's it's and, and I always confuse confuse which hemisphere of the brain controls what, which is the artistic side, you know, et cetera. But you're very much in one side of your brain when you're trying to drive that manual transmission and, mm-hmm. and coordinate the clutch and the accelerator and the and the gear shift. Uh, over time, it migrates from from one hemisphere to the other and it becomes so second nature that you could well you could you shouldn't but you could talk on your phone and you probably text people right while doing all of the same whereas in the beginning it's very difficult but uh it, any of these skills tend to function the same way where they they start out in a very conscious and very labored part of your mind and then they get uh, they gradually migrate to to a place where it's it's innate or natural or second nature or whatever you want to call it. And, and that's why we rehearse. I mean, you, you go to the probably the most famous dancer of all time being Fred Astaire. Uh, him or Gene Kelly, I guess, would be the two most famous. But you go to Astaire and he always made everything look like it was effortless and easy to do. And everybody that knows knows that he worked for hours and hours and hours to get it to look that way. Um, oh, yeah. So it, Yeah, he was uh, he would frequently have his partner's feet bleeding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. He did love to rehearse, and why not? I mean, he, he demanded perfection, and he also, I think he had it written into his deal that he was always shot head to toe. Yeah, so you could see everything. There were no tricks. No, there was, there's no, and that's, that's one of the reasons that we, that his stuff lasts so long, uh, and that we love it. We, I mean, you, you can examine every frame, uh, Study him endlessly. He's he's terrific. Yeah, absolutely. At what point do you think that you thought to yourself, "Hey, I'm actually pretty good at this, and maybe I can make a living at it." 
Maybe never. It was when I was young and stupid. <laughs> um, Before USC? Uh, beg your pardon? Before USC? Possibly. Maybe more about the time I got into USC. I think confidence started to bloom with, with instruction there and meeting, uh, meeting people and having lessons that I had learned as uh, a high schooler and before validated by interactions with other people. Um, I think the, the, uh, the repeated encounters with, um, Professionals. Mentorism or encouragement tended to uh, tended to underscore, I think, the things that felt right and natural. Um, I I think I believe I, well. I believe I I got confident and cocky while in I, when, while in college because I auditioned for some things and I got cast in some things. And uh, I still didn't know what I didn't know. Of course. And that's a wonderful thing. It's it's uh, sky's the limit. You, when you learn the magnitude of what you don't know, that you suddenly start to doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the but more 20, the more the more that you do and know, the more you realize what you don't know or don't know how to do. Absolutely. Or that you you realize, hey, I've been doing that wrong all these years. <laughs> But, but it worked. But getting away with uh, it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, absolutely. Uh, it, it's it's a um, it's a kind of a thing where that kind of confidence it comes and hopefully it stays with you for a long time. But for some people, it doesn't. Sometimes it just does go away. Uh, yeah. Well, that kind of happened to me as an actor. Hmm. Uh, I I I started to lose confidence in the work and I started to lose trust in directors really particularly in episodic television and that made me question whether or not I wanted to keep pursuing that as a career is it because they weren't really giving you any direction they were more manipulating cameras and and staging it's been so long I, I couldn't tell you I couldn't give you a, a real specific answer to that mm -hmm. um I couldn't say on a case-to-case -case basis because I worked with some wonderful television directors who were really affiliative and great and supportive. Um, it just it just ceased having the cachet for some reason, and um, and uh, I felt more intrigued or more fulfilled by pursuing learning another craft. Mm -hmm. so, all right, so you you obviously have worked on both stage and behind, not behind, but in front of the camera as an actor, what would yeah. you what would you say, and also obviously with voice actors, and we'll talk about the, uh, those in a, in a bit because I'm very fascinated by voice voiceover actors um, or voice actors. Uh, uh, what would you say are the major differences for people who don't know, what are the major differences between acting on the stage and acting in front of a camera? I have to give credit to my long ago manager for this answer. His name is Jim Curtin. Mm -hmm. And he broke it down in a way that made perfect sense for me. Uh, he maintained that a film actor has to allow the camera to ravish them, mm. uh, to succumb to the camera, and that a stage actor has to ravish the audience, that the energy is completely the other direction. How interesting. And I think that's, I think that's true in the main. Um, I, I, you know, I think of James Dean and how everybody is so in, entranced by his mystique. He hides from the camera, even, mm -hmm. when you watch his work. And that makes him really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it, it pulls you to the edge of your seat and... Uh, uh, that's uh, that's part of that's part that's part of it. I think uh, I've seen Ian McKellen on Broadway play Salieri in 
Amadeus. In, uh, Amadeus. And by God, he ravished the audience. Mm -hmm. From the opening moments, he took us by the throat, and we were at his mercy. So, so the big um, difference is the camera has to be over. let in, and stage, you have to let it out. Yes, yeah. That's very interesting. I've never heard it said that way, but it's absolutely true. Because uh, the, ca the camera sees virtually everything in you, and on stage, you have to project it out. So I, yes, I think that's, yeah. that's very, very interesting and valuable. Um, you, you know, you've been lucky enough. Obviously, you, as you said, you've worked with some directors who, for whatever reason, um, made it so that it was a little more difficult for you to uh, carry on as an actor. But you've also worked with um, some really great directors like Randall Kleiser and like Sam Fuller. Um, what important lessons did you take away from them? I, well, each of them had wonderful skills with camera and very unique personal ways of, of uh, using the camera to tell their stories. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about Randall's work in Greece is how he makes everybody, even the, the background people, look gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, Due in large part to Randall, it's also all credit to Bill Butler, who was our, our DP. Right. Um, but together, they really caressed and loved the cast. Uh, Olivia looks spectacular. John looks gorgeous. Of course. Everybody just glows. Um, Randall was very free in the set. He allowed us to improvise when he found uh, parts of the the script to be maybe a little tight, a little uh, not loose enough for his tastes. Um, he would have us improvise scenes, and he, those scenes were used in the film. So he was very freeing. And I, I would say most of my, where I began to, to become disenchanted with acting on, on camera, it was more on the te television side. Right. And it had probably had something to do with Time factor, speed. Uh, the features are different, a different ball game altogether. They they, um, they they take their time on things, whereas TV has to move forward pretty quickly. Well, to a to a certain degree, Sam Fuller certainly didn't take his time. <laughs> uh, he, he Sam knew what he was doing and put his faith in his uh, his DP, um, who happened to be Adam Greenberg on one of his early shoots. who's was fantastic cinematographer absolutely and um sam knew precisely what he wanted and uh he'd get one take that he liked he'd ask adam did you get it adam would say yes yeah, sam i got it and sam would say forget it next setup and we'd move on wow he didn't have any insecurity about his work we rehearsed scenes uh thoroughly which was always good and he was a very clear communicator and then if uh if a mistake happened on film, Sam loved it. He embraced mistakes. Do, do you find that you do the same with, with voice direction? Mistakes can sometimes be fun, <laughs> but um, more often than not, we like to get things as written, at least one. <laughs> yes. But often mistakes and improv uh, are, are very welcome. Oh, oh, some some of the great lines in the history of TV animation are improvised. Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> without a doubt. We've got uh, some incredible actors working in, in voiceover now who, who whose improv skills are beyond belief. And, uh, you know, recording uh, digitally gives you the luxury of, you, know, you can just open up the the mic and record until you get something you're delighted with. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've, you know, you've done a lot of directing in both uh, the, the studio, i.e. the recording booth, and also on stage. Do you have a preference for one over the other when you're directing? Is it, Do you prefer to direct for theater or voices, or does it are they just two different things? Uh, they tickle different parts of your imagination. Um, there, are, there are pluses and minuses to both mainly pluses. Uh, I love the theater because it's, uh, 
there's more control. It's not quite so specialized. Uh, I get to interface with all of the crafts behind the scenes, mm -hmm. wardrobe, scenic design, projections, lights. Uh, all of that is, is stimulating and fun uh, to work with other craftspeople to, to make a theatrical production come to life. Mm -hmm. is great. There's nothing quite like it. But the rehearsal process can be arduous sometimes, um, particularly if there's choreography involved. That's something that I struggle with uh, because I, I set a high standard and uh, <laughs> seldom meet it. Um, <laughs> in voiceover, what has is, what is trended of late in the last 10 years or so is there's a lot more single mic recording and a lot less ensemble recording, really? at least on the shows that I'm working. Really? And and and, yeah. and what, do you find that disadvantageous in any way, where you don't have the actors actually responding to one another? No. No, because it's it's easy with the tools that we have to to call up cues or to build a, a, an exchange between characters on the spot if we need to. Uh, but part of the skill set is keeping in mind what you did with somebody two days ago mm -hmm. uh, when you pick up the scene again and you have the other side of the conversation to record. That's that's part of the skill set. It's just, um, it's a little lonelier when you've got one person in the booth and they're just doing all of their lines um, than it uh, used to be when you'd have all 12 of your cast members in a room. and Yeah be bouncing around like a radio player. Yeah, that was fun. I mean, the times that I got to be in the studio, that was a lot of fun. Uh, oh, it's a blast because your material comes to life and you can start to, you know, your, your moviola starts rolling in your own imagination and you can kind of see the, the film come to life. And now it's much more slow and, and deliberate. But that has its rewards too because you can really indulge the time to... Uh, to, to have some improv and to play a little bit and and allow the actor to become more of a collaborator with the creative team than they would be if you had to keep to the rigid time schedule that a, a group record demands. Can, can you, over the years of doing it, can you sense a, a, a big difference in the way that performances come out, or is it pretty similar? It's pretty similar. Um Although, I, I, there again, you can handcraft animated product to a greater degree now if you're recording one actor at a time than you, than you can if you're doing an ensemble record. Um, you can really get in and nuance of performance. Uh, single mic recording is much more the norm in feature films, hmm. feature animated films. Mm -hmm. Um, so what it does is it brings television product uh, closer to the feature level in terms of, of how the track ultimately winds up being constructed. Okay, so, so I, I know why you do voiceover work um, to a, for at least partially. It's because you get paid for it. But <laughs> in, in, the, in the theater, you get paid a little bit too, but it's a lot harder to make money in the theater. Um, you continue to go back to the theater simply for, for love, I assume. Yeah, it's a tonic. It it gives you some kind of found. You go back to your foundations in the theater, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I I do like I like being in the space. Being in a theater is a wonderful, it's a wonderful place to be, uh, both when it's full of an audience and when it's empty, mm -hmm. and people are building scenery. Or hanging lights. It's just a it's a, a nifty environment. Um, mainly, and I do a lot of directing with with young actors at the university level. Right. Mainly, it's a chance to recharge my batteries, to interact with people who are uh, energetic and uh, starting out on their careers. Um, Full of dreams, and uh, and dialed into the latest trends and uh, and movement in the in the in the form. Um, that keeps me on my toes and 
is challenging. That, that helps to keep you fresh, doesn't it? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, it, 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 there's a degree of, of teaching that goes along with working at, at the university level. Sure. Um, which, which, it recharges you in two ways. It, it reminds you of the things that you learned long ago that you may have forgotten, and it reminds you to honor those things, but you also learn a lot more about the craft from the people you're teaching. I've always found that to be the case. Mm -hmm. Your students teach you more than you teach them. I I agree, and as you well know, I I have been teaching for a number of years now uh, screenwriting, and and yeah, I learn as much from them as they do from me. They just don't know it. Yeah, it's isn't it a weird thing? It's 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 a it's an unusual dynamic. Well, because you're seeing all these different perspectives on how to approach something, and right, uh, and so things that you may have never conceived on your own, you you're oh well, there's that. How that's an interesting way to think about things, um, uh, and sometimes you're a step ahead of them, but frequently they're a step ahead of you. So it's it's helpful in that way. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And so, okay, so when you go into, uh, let's talk about your process in preparing to direct. Is Are there similarities and differences between preparing to direct a stage show and preparing to direct um, an, an animation script? What are those differences in your preparation to go in there? With animation, because it, it sneaks up on you and, and, you know, when you're in studio you got to be all on top of the the action and and the characters motivations uh i i read the scripts deeper on an initial read and i mark them up uh in a probably a unique way because i've written animation scripts i've reviewed storyboards for my entire 30-year animation career Mm -hmm. um i've learned most of the functions in the process even though I don't draw um, but I'll I'll break a script down very deeply uh, so that I can kind of roll it in my mind as a film before I go in and work with the actors all right so what do you mean and by sometimes what do you mean I'm by wrong. well of course but that's the art you know you're not always going to hit it but but most of the time I guess you do um, the, the, what do you mean by deeply describe deeply what does that mean I'll read every, I'll read every shot. I'll read every bit of direction. Uh, I'll soak up what is the character holding in their hand, what is going on in the background, where's the scene set, uh, what what does this scene lead to in terms of setup or payoff for the, the uh, sub uh, subsequent scenes. Um, uh, what are the possibilities? Where are we planting? Uh, where are we planning running gags? Uh, because if I'm just recording one character who's setting up the running gag, I've got to know who that works with down the line when I bring the other actor in. Mm-hmm. And uh, in a way, it's it's kind of sweeping up behind the elephant or the riders <laughs> to make to make sure that that I honor what they're going for, and being a bit of a backstop too in case in case and. Most of the time it's not the case, but in case they've missed an opportunity or, or something has been, uh, will get lost in translation. Um, but it's, it's a deeper read. It's contrasted to the theater uh, because the rehearsal process is protracted. Um, I will read and prep a script. Uh, and when it's with something like Shakespeare, it's very deep because there have to be a lot of cuts and things to make it palpable to a contemporary audience. Right, right. But um, the the experiencing of the story uh, and the real deep reading of the of the material tends to happen in rehearsal. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't rehearse in voiceover. We come in and the actors are they've had a chance to read the, the script, and we'll start knocking out the lines cold they, and so they've reviewed it enough for that they feel comfortable with it i assume they feel comfortable and they 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 go with their instincts and and really the really great voice voiceover actors understand all the tropes mm-hmm. uh 
to the degree that they can play the trope straight, they can play the trope flopped, they can play the trope inverted, upside down and inside out. Um, because sometimes it, it takes that to to make uh, to make the scene right. Mm-hmm. I, I know that you've um, you've worked with some of the if not all of the very best voice actors on the planet. Um, t- t- what kind of special things have you seen them do in the studio that kind of blew your mind? <laughs> it's it's never ending. Um, <laughs> something that that blows my mind but may not be all that impressive to somebody who is a layperson is when... Um, a journeyman voiceover actor comes in and creates a new character, having probably having read the script, but having no idea really what the writer has in mind, and um, and out of whole cloth, right then and there, within a space of two or three minutes, creates the character and and goes on to to live in that character's skin for for eleven minutes or twenty two minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it's it's instant. It's not something that they've been thinking about or planning or rehearsing in their kitchen and toiling over. It's it's uh, it's very much like improv, um, because of whatever tools and and and, and uh, references they might rely on. And everybody has a different process. Uh, Corey Burton is a walking encyclopedia of vaudeville and old radio. <laughs> And he concocts this alchemical mix of references of uh, uh, Eugene Pallett and God knows who. He blends them, uh, <laughs> and, and what comes out is something altogether new and extraordinary. <laughs> Have, um, you've worked with Frank Welker, I assume. I worked with Frank Welker the day before yesterday. <laughs> and it... I, I don't. He allegedly can do. I've never heard it, but people have told me that he can do two distinct duck sounds at the same time. You're probably right. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever heard him do that, but um, he is exquisitely talented. Unbelievable. And, and you don't even realize it. Uh, he gives you ten times more material than you could ever use, and. Um, and his first take is always brilliant, and what comes after that is <laughs> conscious consciousness altering. <laughs> <laughs> and and yet, Frank is the nicest guy in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, always on time, always cheerful, uh, and it's such a joy. The the other thing that the uh, voice actors do that is astonishing to me is they can just like you say create this character and then go away for weeks or months or even a year a year or more and come back and their characters repeats for some reason and they're dead on the money again oh yeah absolutely and they have it in their head somehow and i don't know how they remember it but they do and they um it's i think i think it's because the very best the very best of these people the, the Rob Paulsons, the Tress McNeils, the, the Rusie Taylors, um, they don't do voices. They do characters. They create characters. Yeah, yeah. And the characters, once they do them, are fam- as familiar to them as as their next door neighbor or a, a cousin <laughs> or an, you know Aunt Matilda. Um, and that that really is what separates great voice actors from from people who just do voices and make funny sounds. Right. Do, can, can you think of a, of uh, throughout your whole career, a truly challenging problem you had in the studio or and how you solved it? Mm. It's, there's, there's, <laughs> yes, there have been some truly challenging problems. They, they come from all different corners. Uh, some, there's, there's something I was talking about the other day uh, it, it's uh, a thing I've noticed that distinguishes young uh, male actors from young female actors, and I'm talking about kids in that 10, 11-year-old range. Mm-hmm. Uh, if there's something that happens uh, 
well, we all know what happens between with, with boys and girls when, when puberty comes along. Yes. But young, young male actors tend to struggle, not vocally so much, with that transition uh, as much as they do with uh, an awareness of self. Uh, the biggest problem is to, to have established a character with a, with a young kid who is absolutely um, uh, free and not super self-aware and just out there, maybe a precocious reader, creates a character that is charming and wonderful. And then six or eight months will go by, and the kid's now 11 and a half, <laughs> and much more aware of who they are and maybe a little more uncomfortable in their skin. And you ask them to do that cute little bunny character, and suddenly it's I, I don't I don't I don't like to I don't want to do this I feel vulnerable <laughs> self-conscious self-conscious girls don't seem to struggle with it as much mm. in general uh, it's a big generality but I haven't seen it work that way so much but that's sometimes the biggest struggle because you really have to be a psychologist on a certain level at, at those times and and uh, would you say you're pretty good at it at this point, at being that psychologist? I honestly don't know. <laughs> sometimes you feel like, wow, we got through that. That was a success. And sometimes you just kind of go, I hope that works. I, I, I wouldn't be so uh, bold as to say I'm good at that. We, you know, every situation's a little bit different. Do you get notes back from the studio or the network sometimes going, what happened here? Sometimes. Sometimes it'll... <laughs> It might not be notes or even a question. It might be uh, a script it. with pickups, and you look at it and you go, gee, this is a long pickup script. Oh, every line for for the bunny <laughs> is being picked up. I guess we're recasting. Yeah. Um, that doesn't happen that often, but it has happened in the past, mm -hmm. where it's just insurmountable, and it comes as no surprise that, oh, that actor's not doing voiceover anymore. Why? Well, they're playing lacrosse at their private school, mm -hmm. in, you know, in Coldwater Canyon. So, so uh, let's talk about casting for two seconds, um, because I know you've been a casting director as well when you're in production. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, most voice actors these days have some kind of a, a reel that you can listen to um, mm -hmm. or, or something specific that you've asked them to prepare. What, give some advice to those who are looking to get into that business as to what would be an advantageous for them to put on a reel and things that would be disadvantageous they should not put on a reel. Well, that's a pretty, that's a, Broad. That's a sweeping, or that <laughs> question is narrow, but it has a sweeping answer. Yeah. Um, in general, I would say accents are not characters. An accent is an accent. Good. If a character has an accent, great. Um, but early mistakes, myself included, when I did an early voiceover tape, which I hope by the grace of God someone's destroyed. <laughs> um, I, uh, I happen to have it right here, Kelly. Oh, great. Yeah. Roll some of that for the audience's <laughs> delight uh, and amusement. Um, it, I, it's important to start out uh, attempting to create characters, but more than that, I think a, a sample tape uh, or a, a reel, if you will, uh, needs to be distinctly animation characters, uh, if, it, uh, if, if that's what you're going for, uh, distinctly commercial, if that's what you're going for. You shouldn't be blending. People doing that shouldn't be blending commercial copy with animation copy mm -hmm. with maybe narrative book copy. Those things should all be kept discreet. Um, and then in animation, where I do most of my work, uh, I like to use the analogy of making your tape by going into a very intelligently laid out uh, retail establishment. Okay. Um, or for that, for that matter, a, a very intelligently laid out grocery store. You have to put up front something that's going to catch the shopper's attention, that's definitive and speaks uniquely of you, 
Um, and then the rest of the shopping experience has to have variety. So if it's a ladies shop, which I don't go into often, but whatever you've got in the window, that may be your lead statement. And then you work your way to the handbags, and then you work your way to the accessories, and you work your way to the gowns, and you work your way back to the, the jackets and so forth, so that it creates a shopping experience of, of characters. Uh, there should be a sense of humor. There should be um, a, a very stark contrast between the voices to show uh, dexterity. There should be a good, uh, good samples of an understanding of dynamic you know, loudness, softness, uh, and of course, always tempo, mm -hmm. rhythm. Uh, if everything is the same rhythm, you're going to bore people to death. So it's it's a little like a concerto in a in a ladies in a ladies shop, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Get, well, that's that's somebody's going to do a show called Concerto in a Lady Shop. Um, <laughs> uh, so so do, should they try to figure out how to make it? play out with a little bit of an arc to it like it has a, like you're telling a story in a way it never hurts it never hurts I, I and I also think if people have the ability to to write their own copy so that it is unique to them mm -hmm. or incorporate bits of copy that they have uh, that they've actually been hired to do that's always helpful um, and you know these things are as unique as fingerprints uh, length is, uh, you know, an enemy. They should be brief. They should be quick. They should show facility, um, a sense of humor, and uh, the takeaway should be, gosh, that person's versatile and sounds like they're really funny and fun to work with. Do, do they need to feel... This is a question I've always had about animation in general, and that is uh, voice actors for animation tend to be able to tell a story with their voice in ways that other actors don't. Um, it it's almost has to be a little bit bigger than life, or am I wrong? No, no, you're right. I think uh, it's always apparent to me when, uh, when somebody comes in I haven't worked with before, I generally can guess if they have studied and, and played a musical instrument, and I can generally guess if they are theater or slash stage trained. Mm -hmm. Those people are always going to have a leg up on someone who is not a musician and hasn't had any stage training. Interesting. Uh, there, here again, we talked about rhythm. You know the difference between on camera and and, and uh, stage actors. Right. And and uh, on camera being more uh, submissive to the to to the camera and and stage actors being more aggressive. Voiceover actors. Because you don't have the same bag of tricks you have on camera, you leave 90% of it at home. You have to fill that up with some of the tricks you, you, you garner from working on stage. Uh, kinesthetic work. You know, what is it like when I'm running, when I'm doing yoga and I'm twisted into a pretzel, when I'm swinging from the yard arm on a square rigger, uh, you know, when I've just popped up from being held under water uh, for longer than I can endure, and I'm coming up from uh, for a big gasp of air. Mm -hmm. Those things have to be vividly played, and um, and it does take uh, a bit of larger than life inclination. For mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to the 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 voice has to carry that moment, even though the animation will fill in with picture, but the voice has to carry it somewhat. It does. It has to. The performance has to draw the ink out of the pen. Ooh, that's neat. The voice has to draw the ink out of the pen. I love so, it. A lot of times, we we like to get the dialogue tracks to the to the storyboard artists as soon as we can because it definitely affects how they pose out their boards. I think that's got to be accurate. That the, that they'll they'll animate a character differently by the way the voice sounds, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, they will animate breaths. Uh, a lot of times actors strive not to be heard breathing, but uh, the very best voiceover actors incorporate that into their performance. Mm. How, how cool is that? There's a little trick most people probably don't well, know. It's, it's, it's wonderful when you think about it. And there's, there's method to the madness. Um, one of the reasons 
I'm convinced one of the reasons that there is a dwarf named Sneezy of the Seven <laughs> is because it makes him alive. Mm-hmm. Grumpy is an attitude. Happy is an attitude. Bashful is an attitude. Doc is a p- profession. Sneezy is breathing. <laughs> Sneezy has post-nasal drip. He is freaking alive, and that is genius. <laughs> if anybody thinks about, well, why, why that? I mean, it's like he's a one-note pon- one-trick pony. No. He renders everybody else living and breathing, and that's part of the genius that is Walt Disney and his creative team. That is that. a... That's a that is a brilliant observation. Um, were you so we're going to talk for just a little bit about writing, which we haven't gotten into too much uh, so far. Um, when, were you always a storyteller as a kid? No, you weren't a storyteller. No. I was a liar as a kid sometimes. <laughs> well, get get <laughs> in line, counts. get in line, <laughs> take a number. <laughs> um, but no, I um, I didn't I did not. I didn't understand, in spite of all my training and growing up in a theater family, I didn't understand the connection between dance and storytelling. Or, I mean, I I did when I watched it on film, um, or acting in a play and, and being a storyteller. I was a storyteller when I said somebody else's words. Mm-hmm. But I didn't really intellectually stop to ponder, well, where's my contribution to this? Um, and I think that's somewhat common in, in instructing actors, particularly at early ages. Just say the words and, and you know, do the movement, hit your, you know, do your blocking, sing the song, and you've done your job. Um, of course, changed my opinion on that since uh but no i never had any desire to write uh i avoided it at all costs um no I, what, when did that change what what turned you into a writer what what brought you to it hunger <laughs> hunger hunger turned me into a writer um that's that's a bit cheeky uh i i was living in hollywood my i was acting I had a child, um, I was married, and acting jobs were starting to get sparse because I'd entered into a kind of a, a, a in-between zone. I was 24, 25, uh, I looked like I was 17, 18, so I was auditioning for those roles but competing with actors who were that age mm-hmm. and starting to age out of some of those opportunities, and uh, a long-term, probably my oldest buddy with whom I'm still in contact, Craig Strong, said, hey, uh, let's, go, let's go take a class at the Groundlings. And I thought, okay, well, he's my buddy. I'll have some support. We'll go down there. And the Groundlings improv turned out to be a lot about writing. Impromptu. Creating character. It's improv. Mm-hmm. Um, and even after going through the Groundlings program, I resisted the idea of writing. But while there, I met somebody uh, who became a mentor and urged me to learn to write. His name is Jeff Siegel. And yeah. um, he patiently, generously tutored me and convinced me to try to write screenplays that I could act in. That was the carrot. Um, it didn't work out that way. Uh, I did write some screenplays with Jeff on spec, and uh, I learned the craft and eventually became comfortable with doing that. And uh, through my association with him, I got hired at Hanna-Barbera to write. Wow. What was the first thing you did at Hanna-Barbera? Well... The first thing I did was collaborate with Jeff as a freelance writer on a couple uh, a couple shows that he was writing. And he was generous enough to mentor me along. I wasn't credited with writing or, or, or assisting or 
whatever you'd call it. But it did get my toes wet. Officially, I began work on a show called The Challenge of the Gobots. And it's really ironic because I, I was brought in very few credits officially. Uh, I was brought in as Jeff's associate story editor, which was a laugh because <laughs> I had no more qualifications to be a story editor than I did to be uh, a nuclear physicist. Well, they're, they're, the same, they're the same thing. Yes, they're very close, <laughs> very closely aligned. Um, but it was a great gift. I thought, I'll do this for a year. I'll build up a war chest. I'll go back to acting. Uh, I'll look a year older. <laughs> <laughs> and things will be great. Well, I never went back. Getting that steady paycheck was intoxicating. It was great. I could put food in my kid's mouth. You must have enjoyed uh, it. You must have been, it must have been fun. It was fun. It was fun. I met Alan Burnett mm -hmm. there. Um, Who's also been a guest on this show, by the way. Pardon? Uh, Alan Burnett has also been a guest on this show. Yes, he has. In, in fact, I listened to Alan Burnett's interview. That one's got a that one's that one's a very good show though. Early on in the in the uh, process of doing Story Beat, um, Alan's show was te technically a little off, but that's t technical. Not the show itself was great. Yeah, no, Alan is a font. He is, I mean, a tremendous writer, wonderful guy. Tremendous, tremendous. Yeah, yeah, um, he's he's great. And uh, being around him uh, early on was uh, certainly a boon to my career. Uh, and I maintain relationships with most of those guys that I met back on Hanna, uh, on, on the Hanna Barbera uh, uh, assignments. P people that you've continued to work with on and off over the years. Yeah, I work uh, regularly with Mark Seidenberg. Oh, Mark Seidenberg, who was, sure. Uh, who came aboard, I think, in '84, same year I did. And uh, Mark Young. And Mark uh, Young, sure regular contact with Mark, with whom uh, I wrote a couple films and a lot of television. Um, it, was a, it was like going to college. And um, when that group spread out, they populated Disney TV animation and they populated uh, Warner Brothers. And it really was... Uh, it was a great time. Was, the was there late a, 80s, early 90s? Was the, yeah, that was, and, that, and through the 90s, that was boom time in that whole business. Um, it really was. Did, at what point did you think, similar to the question about a acting or being a performer, at what point did you think to yourself, you know what, I, this is not only fun and it's making me money, but I'm not bad at it. I'm pretty good at this. I can do this. How long did that take? That took, I think, two or three years to really get comfortable and feel like, okay, I, I understand the craft, and I think I exercise it pretty well. But it's, it's, it's constant learning, as you know. Constant. You're constantly learning and relearning things, uh, and the people that you work with teach you. Um, uh, the storyboard artists that you work with teach you. Uh, it's a wonderful environment in that regard, and it was in those days because Hanna Barbera maintained a writing staff full year round, thirty to thirty five staff writers. And unlike today, when a show ends and and writers are dropped, Hanna Barbera bridged all of those writers through development times and and on special projects and kept us on staff full time. But not anymore. Amazing. Not any. Nobody does that anymore, though, do they? No, no. That that's unheard of. But um, it was uh, it was amazing. It was terrific. I, I remember in the '90s, it was common for um, producers, studios, and so on to to do 65 episode blocks. That went away right. after a while. Um, now you right. That um, that anchored my my first job. The GoBots was a 65 episode order. And that, that was your, so, and you were on that from the beginning of it? No. Uh, the first five were done as kind of a, uh, a movie, I guess, a TV movie. It was one continuous arc story. Got it. And then after that, there, were, there was an order of 60 more. Um, 
I collaborated behind the scenes on one of those episodes. I think Alan Burnett wrote one of those episodes um, or two. Uh, but after those were established, um, the full order was, was put in, and then I was brought on staff to co-story edit or associate story edit with, with Jeff Siegel. Mm. And um, during those days, we worked with uh, Eric Lewald. Yeah. I think got his first animation writing assignment on that show. John Loy got his first writing assignment on that show. Mark Zaslov got his first writing wow. assignment on that show. Wow. Uh, a ton of people came into the industry and soon established themselves as the go-to guys for for animation mm -hmm. because people were wrapping up and as you say 65 episodes was pretty standard and and hot hands needed to were needed all around oh they were you could roll out of bed in the morning and they'd be hitting you with scripts because there were so many that they needed to get done um, yeah it was great it, that was a tremendous time. Tell me what tricks, if any, that you have when you're trying to develop both a story and a char and characters. What are your tricks for develop developing those things when they don't exist? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, we've got another three hours. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a, Do you have any particular trick or go to that you use? Any kind of technique when you're saying, "Hey, I got to develop characters for a show." Um, mm, not really, it's not so much a trick, but I find, I find that, uh, I draw a lot from the things I read. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't, not to say, not to say I, <laughs> I take direct ideas, but when I'm doing something creative, I need to, I need to have input of some kind of data. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I've been working on a project lately, and I've been reading a biography of Don Larson, the uh, the, the Yankees pitcher who right. pitched a, a perfect, perfect game, game in the 1956 World Series. Right. Um, just inputting that information helps other ideas. They help feed the wellspring. And it's not baseball. I'm not doing anything about baseball. It's something completely other, but, uh, but I don't have a particular trick. I do like to I do like to take characteristics of people I have known and people I know, and fold them into characters. Um, it's a sly game, and sometimes it honors individuals, and sometimes it's a little bit of a poke at personality quirks. <laughs> Does anybody catch you at it? No. Because you've no. got you've got it well masked by the time it's in a story. By the time it, yeah, by the time it's in a story, it's pretty it's pretty well uh, mixed up. The DNA is scrambled enough that <laughs> that there's not a whole lot of recognizable. So, and lately you've also, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you've been working on a book series, the the Note Hunter. Um, do you find that there's a huge difference in the way that you develop uh, the, uh, a a book that's you know prose versus a script? Do you do you find those skill sets different or are they very similar not the development part the the story outlining which is a critical step in the process is pretty similar um, but uh, actually you know it, it, applying the discipline of writing dialogue for uh, a book is is quite a bit different the the form and format of uh, of a screenplay is a real aid, frankly, when you can, particularly with some, a, a tool like Final Draft, w when you can hit a key and you're automatically in the margin for the character's name and you do a carriage return and you got a dialogue margin. and Those things are very helpful. Uh, it's, it's not like that writing the book. It's a little bit more painstaking, I find. But the outlining part, which is really the heavy lifting, is virtually the same, to, to my mind. Mm -hmm. But these are short stories; they're not, they're not novels and big long tomes. So no, but you, you I don't have enough experience really to answer that question. Well, it's it, the the big differences, as you already pointed out, are 
that you're in prose, you're you're not just putting a character name in the center of a page and then writing dialogue beneath it. You actually have to do certain grammatical things to it, like put in quotation marks and so on. Um, right, and the, the, it's also a lot of fun to to get into to being God a bit and and writing what's going on between the characters' ears that's not spoken. Absolutely. Um, because you can open up time and space all you want uh, to, to to linger on a on a, the briefest of thoughts uh, in the middle of, of action. That's kind of fun to do as well. Well, in script writing, we can only deal with those two senses, sight and sound. Uh, but in a novel, you can deal with all of the senses because you can put it into the reader's head. And yeah. Let them imagine it. Uh, th- that's also a huge difference and, and um, uh, you know, significant in how you would approach a particular story. It's one of the beauty parts about musicals that I talk to people all the time about. I, I, you know, I consult on musicals and people send me their stuff and I, I read it. And too frequently they're trying to tell the story and what's going on with their characters in song. They're trying to do plotting in the song, recitative. Mm. And what they need to concentrate on with songs, which is similar to this process we're talking about, they need to concentrate in songs on this ability to talk about what's going on internally with the character, how they feel, and what they're thinking, which you can do in a song that you can't do otherwise. Right, right. You, 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 you have drive the story emotionally, right? but not plot-wise. That, that's correct. It's, it's, it's interesting. There, you know, a book, is, a book is at one end of the spectrum, a film's at the other, and, and, and a stage musical or a stage drama is kind of in the middle because you can do those songs or you could do uh, a monologue in Shakespeare that opens you uh, or opens your character up psychologically and you can get insight to what they're thinking. Uh, uh, you can really do it in the novel. You got no time. You got to show it visually in the film, but, but stage gives you that unique blend of the two. But, but you would be very pressed, hard pressed to do anything like that in, say, an animated show for a kid where the characters just start talking about what's going on in their head. That yes. wouldn't happen. Unless perhaps you're doing it uh, for, for the French. <laughs> for the French. <laughs> well, I guess if there's an audience in France, you may as well go for that. Um, it's true. Uh, my 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 part my long ago partner Mark Young was working on, and this is going to be a digression, but he was working on a, a Robin Hood animated Robin Hood project some years ago, and was laughingly complaining to me that that some of the scripts had to be written by French writers, and they were getting episodes back where. Robin Hood and his merry men were talking, sitting around and talking about, yes, but is it right to rob from the rich and give to the poor? <laughs> pondering that question. <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> Exciting that, animation, that, that... That gets into both politics and storytelling, you know. <laughs> should, should you rob from the rich to give to the poor? Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know about the robbery part, but it'd be nice to give something to the poor. <laughs> so we have been, believe it or not, talking for one hour and 12 minutes, and we're going to wrap this thing up. Um, and so I'm going to go to the last two questions that I ask everybody. And the first is, and we've talked about some of this already, but let's hear what you, what story you might have. I know that, you know, you've obviously worked with a lot of various great people in the industry. Um, do you have an oddball or a quirky or an offbeat or a weird or just plain funny story that you can share? Um, a, co- a couple come to mind. Let's give them both. Uh, <laughs> it depends on how, how much time we have. you got all uh, the time you need. I was, uh, I was newly freelance. I'd just come off of being an MGM exec, and I was looking around for filling my dance card with enough projects to make sure I, w- I wouldn't freak out about not being regularly employed. And I got a call from an old buddy, um, somebody actually, I think, with whom I had done a, a student film at USC as, a, as an actor who had, uh, like me, become a writer in the intervening years. And uh, he invited me to come down and meet <clears throat> on a project uh, that... <clears throat> involved adapting the Velveteen Rabbit. Right. Uh, which is, you know, in the public domain and 
I, I love this story. And so I, I said, yeah, sure, I'll come down and discuss it. And we got into a, a pretty detailed discussion about how this might adapt into um, a lovely, charming uh, animated short. And um, we seemed to be all on the same page. There were several people in the room, and, and it came time to discuss in general terms you know, what the deal would be like. And one of the guys who was in the room said, well, for starters, this will be a co-writing credit. And up to this point, everything had been framed as, and you're going to write this, and we'll write this, and you'll write that, and you'll deliver the outline. So I was a little mystified, and I said, well, how's, how's that if I'm, if I'm doing all the writing? And this guy, without missing a beat, said, well, we'll just be giving heavy notes. <laughs> I mean, literally, I couldn't believe it. It's like, really? You're going to get a co-writing credit for giving, giving heavy, heavy notes? Yeah. And and at that time, <laughs> you know, that was dire. Now it's a little bit more, it's more accepted. And so I'll, I'll leave you with that one. I do have another one if you want to use this instead. Um, and uh, it has to do with animation. And I'm writing this direct-to-video feature. Mm-hmm based on uh, an American tale. Um, this is well after I had worked at Universal and with my boss, Jeff Siegel, had helped establish this direct-to-video franchise. They had done one already. This was to be the second one. And um, I pitched them a story concerning Fievel in New York as a, as a self-declared news reporter. And he goes out and... Uh, he lives on the Lower East Side, and he's got a camera, and he covers the rough neighborhoods and uh, gets into all kinds of scrapes and stuff. And, and there's, a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of robberies going on, and he kind of gets into a sort of a noir-feeling uh, detective mode with his news reporting. Right. And um, so I, I got the outline done, and I got sailed through the outline and got a script done. And then they brought, on, uh, brought in an animation director uh, who had problems with the script. <laughs> because, it, it, and this is not a direct quote, but this is a paraphrase, a mouse could never operate the big cameras they had in that <laughs> era. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had worked with this, I, I won't name him, I had worked with this director for years. And I respected and adored him. And I said, well, wait a minute. Really, he has a mouse-sized fiddle in the original film. <laughs> and the director said, no, nothing doing. I don't buy it. It, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> I, it, <laughs> like, okay. He wears a hat and he wears clothes, mouse-sized. Si mouse nope, couldn't sell him on the idea. And they were going to dump the idea. And I said, how about don't dump the idea? Why don't you guys dump me? Because if you're going to, if this is a sticking point, I, we can't go forward. So pay me out for the work done to date. And um, they they did. Uh, and um, Len Yuli was hired to come in and do the rewrite. And Len's a great guy. Has he done your Has he done your show? Oh yes, Len's been on the show. There you go. Well, then you know. <clears throat> I, I love Len. He's a great writer. But he got the gig and uh, turned out quite well. But. Man, it just was a head spinner for me. Did they? Did they? Did they have the? Uh, did Did Fievel use the camera? No. No. <laughs> that no, was. This story was completely redone. R redone. And, and Len did a did a great job, but it was just one of those things that blows your mind. Yeah, it's it's you get those kinds of crazy notes from people sometimes where it says you know a fish would never do that. Well, fish don't talk. Fish you know or whatever it is the, the mouse is not supposed to be doing what you're telling the mouse to do so those are kind of crazy crazy notes um, right uh, right but that's the nature of that beast sometimes um uh and it is you do get those weird notes it, it's like where where's this person coming from because they're not understanding that this is an animated world that you can make the character do anything you want uh, right, you know, or you, you get, can do anything, or you, and it I, can be as big or as little as you want. Or I love that you hear stories all the time about people create a new show or new character or whatever, and somebody will say, "But that character would never say that." And you go, "Well, how would you know what that character would say?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like how in the world. So, all right, last yeah. question of the day: What's 
Um, uh, do you have a, a particularly good piece of advice or a tip for those who are just starting out in the business or even those who are in it for a little bit but trying to get to that next level? Yeah. Um, I would say have a partner. And I don't mean literally have a writing partner if, 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 because some people are not inclined to work that way. But find or have a partner who can read your material, get a second set of eyes on what you're doing, um, uh, a different outlook, uh, a different set of skills, interpretive skills, who can give you true and honest, supportive feedback. Um, uh, in my own case, I, I had a, a real partner who would read my work and say, here's, here's what, where it's not working, here's what is working. Um, I think it gives you three-dimensional perception of, of your work if you get somebody who's nurturing and uh, can give you that kind of feedback, if it's, it, whether it's a, a, an honest-to-God collaborative writing partner or whether it's your mom or an editor. Uh, anybody who thinks Shakespeare didn't, didn't have a collaborator or collaborators is crazy. Mm-hmm. So the, definitely did, whether it was the guys in the acting troupe, whether it was other writers that he bounced ideas off of. I guarantee that those, those plays had collaborative effort. And we know that John Fletcher wrote some of them uh, <laughs> with Shakespeare. Um, but I think that's the best piece of advice. Uh, it, it fast tracks so much. Because you're not just working. Somebody else's thoughts. You're not just working in a void. Which is, cha- right. which is always challenging for writers. When you're li- working alone, you lose sight of the forest for the trees. That old cliche. But it's true that you, do, you can't see it all, and other people can give you that feedback that you aren't able to see at that time. Absolutely. And, and you know, as long as I've been writing, it never fails. I, I'll ask somebody to read something, and they'll say, did you think, did you consider this when you, when you go, oh, my God. Yeah, I just... I just took that for granted that that would make sense, or whatever. And there's also the other the, the other codicil with this is, in those circumstances, you have to remember not to do what somebody says. You have to interpret what they mean mm-hmm. and execute that. Yeah, and when people give you a note on something... Uh, frequently, they're not giving you the the note that's most helpful, but they have <laughs> some, something has has triggered their reaction to it that you then need to consider. You need to consider. You need to filter it through your own storytelling apparatus mm-hmm. and and synthesize what what the answer is, or, or synthesize a means of addressing that issue. I, I, right. tell, I tell my students all the time, you know, when people give you notes, you don't have to agree with them, but you should listen to them because they may spark something else. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And somebody who's really good at giving notes uh, and really honest will preface their note giving by saying, hey, this, the whole idea never would have occurred to me, but this thing is standing out. It's like the nail that's, you know, sticking out that needs to be hammered down. Right. I don't know how I don't know how you're going to hammer it down, what you're going to use to hammer it down with, or whether you want to use the claw end and pull it out and eliminate the nail altogether. Well, but that's a nail that's sticking out. Yeah, right. And that's and so now you're trying to finish a piece and make it great, and that's the difference between what was hurting you and now this has made it great. Um, yeah, that is uh, you know that's very uh, great and wise. Um, advice that you're giving there to have somebody else, a partner or whoever, giving you feedback on your work. Um, Kelly, this has been a great treat today. I'm so glad that you were able to do the show. Um, I know people are going to learn something from it for sure. Well, it's, it's wonderful to talk to you, Steve. It's been too long since we've had an extended conversation. And yeah. It's always great. Yeah. Um, our, our work together spans many forms it does doesn't it <laughs> it does so from, from writing to stagecraft to all you know all kinds of things that is, that is for sure so it's th- always good to catch up thank you for being on the show my pleasure and so we've come to the end of today's story beat if you like this podcast please take a moment to give us a comment rating or review 
on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.